This morning I vetoed the omnibus budget bill, the 985 pages of mostly policy, and I also vetoed the tax bill. We're still reviewing everything else. Uh, my, my goal is to complete our review and make decisions uh, by Friday, the end of the week. I can't promise that, but we're reviewing various matters. You know, I've said all of this before, uh, and I, I noticed that there's this posturing going on outside about how I should be persuaded by legislators who could have persuaded me last week if they've been willing to engage in serious, honest negotiations. But this, uh, this session was, was not about working out agreements with me. It wasn't even about working out the best interests of people in Minnesota. It was about the House Republicans cozying up to the money special interests, giving what they wanted on opioids and elder care and NRA and uh, the Minnesota care buy-in, uh, nixing that, and then uh, getting their talking points to go around uh, the state and claim that I vetoed some important measures, which I uh, unfortunately were part of the bill. Yeah. I was assured about three weeks uh, ago that by the speaker in a, uh, one of our bipartisan morning breakfasts that he intended to present both the opioid bill and the the uh, uh, elder care bill to me separately. Yeah, he didn't do so. I urged and implored them several times over the last uh, few days of the session to send me the school safety bill as a separate matter. And uh, they declined to do so. Uh, the budget bill, if you finally get to the budget part of it, which takes some wading through 985 pages. Uh, you find the things in there that I had asked for that are not included, the uh, special education funding, free kindergarten funding, the University of Minnesota and Minuscule were just savage, uh, just nothing in the, the budget for their needs. Uh, and agency cuts were made that I said from the very beginning I would not uh, support. So that bill, uh, both for the, all the, the policy and also for the, the failure to do what we needed from a budget standpoint, just really, really irresponsible, was not meant to be something that I would sign. It was meant to be something that they could take around the state. The tax bill, as I've also said before, is uh, first of all, did not meet my requirement to have uh, $138 million of of um, emergency school aid in the bill. They had a, a sham, $225 million, is it 25? Yeah, uh, 50 million of which was, was new money coming out of the reserve, and, and um, which is not advisable, but it still was, it was new money. And the others were just, just rearranging existing funding for the schools for the teacher training and for community education, which those groups teachers and community education people have opposed. And it was not new money. It's just robbing from one pot and putting it into another one. Present that and claim that that was a miraculous breakthrough for the schools is just, just really ludicrous and really shameful. Uh, and beyond that, the bill itself, as I've said before, favors large corporations, $200 million tax exemption for people who are um, for large corporations, multinational corporations who are um, repatriating foreign foreign profits, and uh, uh, even the income tax uh, provides twenty dollars to uh, somebody making twenty thousand dollars a year, uh, thirteen times that amount to somebody making two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. The average. Um, Middle-income family making $65,000 a year gets one-third of what, uh, again, top-income people receive. So it was skewed to, uh, again, big corporations and uh, wealthy people, and it's just uh, unacceptable. 
Now, the questions have been raised about what the consequences of that are for the functionality of our, our tax system, so I'd like to ask Mr. Bowerly to address that. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. Now that the outcome of the 2018 legislative session is known, the Minnesota Department of Revenue will work to begin the process of updating the state's filing systems for taxpayers beginning in 2019. This process happens annually at the department starting after the legislative session is over. This year, instead of working through a tax bill, we will update the tax filing system to accommodate the differences between the federal and state tax laws instead of that tax bill. We will work throughout the summer to engage all of our stakeholders in the system. Uh, we will update our computer systems. We have, begun, we have been using this computer system for nearly a decade and have successfully implemented version upgrades, large and small changes each year. The work starts now. We have been preparing for all possible outcomes of the legislative session for several months. Today we will turn to the work and I am confident that the talented and dedicated team at the Department of Revenue will deliver for our customers as we consistently do. We look forward to working together with taxpayers, software vendors, tax preparers and professionals, volunteer income tax sites and other stakeholders to ensure that everyone has that the information that they need, the education and services that they uh, taxpayers will need to meet their obligations under Minnesota's tax law. Thank you. I'd also like to have Commissioner Francis briefly overview of the, where we are fiscally for this span and the next given uh, what did, didn't happen in the session. Uh, good morning, uh, Myron France, Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget. So uh, at the conclusion of today's uh, uh, actions by the governor and depending upon a few other bills, the, the current projected bottom line number for 2018-2019 is now $287,992,000 uh, for the surplus. Um, so we started off, as you'll recall, with $329 million. And so we spent uh, money on the uh, pension reform, about $27 million, and we spent some cash in the bonding bill. That leaves us with a surplus now of $287 million, as I mentioned, 0 0.9. And for 2021, we will have $130 million uh, of surplus remaining for 2021. There was $25 million used from the reserve and the bonding bill for our cash projects, and uh, that's where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Governor, the Republican leaders say this is going to have devastating effects on the state, not just for taxpayers, but also for disabled people, for men large, deputy registrars, a whole host of people who are not going to get uh, the help that they need. Well, that's why they put those important items into the 985 page budget bill, so that when I, which I said I would not support, so they could run around and say exactly what they're saying. Dayton vetoed. People with disabilities, Dayton vetoed elderly, although the senior advocates uh, urged me to veto the bill because they watered it down the elder care so badly. Same, similar with the opioids, where they just sold out to the drug companies and are making taxpayers pay for a very meager initiative rather than what I'd propose. Uh, so even uh, areas where there are good things in the bill that, that I would like to support, uh, Many of the advocates think that they were reduced down to just uh, almost nothingness. And, and then there are other areas where, again, that's why they did this. This wasn't about, if they wanted to get that done for the benefit of the people of Minnesota, they would have put them in separate bills. They sent me all sorts of standalone bills on, on you know, significant to somebody, but really in the scheme of uh, Minnesota, relatively insignificant items. And on matters that really mattered, where they knew they, they could get uh, school safety. They knew that we could agree on that. And they knew that I would sign it and that money would be going out right now. But they didn't want that. They wanted the talking points. They wanted a re-election or election campaign slogans. And that's exactly what they're already doing. Governor, you gave us 117 examples of what you didn't like in this bill. What do you most regret will not pass in the law as a result of your veto? Uh, school safety is important. What was not in the bill that should have been was the pre-kindergarten pre funding, special education funding. The University of Minnesota and Minnesota State got virtually nothing in the, this bill, uh, despite my requests. But, uh, you know, uh, I mean, some of the areas just mentioned about uh, people with disabilities, I mean, they're, they're good features in the bill, which, again, they put in and combined with a lot of 
junk that they knew I was going to pose so they could, so that they wouldn't pass, so they wouldn't go out and benefit the people of Minnesota. And that, that's, that's their strategy, and now they're starting to carry it out. Governor, is this, is this it, or are you inviting new discussions about reconstructing these things? No special session. They've had their chance. They, they messed this session up worse than any I've ever seen. In the last week, 10 days, as you know, it was just absolute chaos. They couldn't agree among themselves. We couldn't get a straight answer because the House and the Senate couldn't speak, couldn't, couldn't agree, and they couldn't, sometimes weren't even speaking to one another. And we got um, measures at the very last minute with uh, no, for, no, no uh, disclosure ahead of time. We talked a couple of months ago how it's going to be a, this is a transparent process. It was the most uh, secretive behind closed doors where the committee chairs would get together, I guess, with the leadership, and they'd decide, and they'd go out and tell the Commerce Committee what they, did, what they decided. Even the, even the Commerce Committees were, were a sham. It was a worst managed legislative session I've ever seen. Governor, Governor of the measures in the omnibus budget bill that you vetoed, what are the most objectionable that maybe you could tick off the top four or five or a dozen or whatever? Appreciate that. Well, I can give you the list, but they, you know, the cuts to the, uh, Again, the cut, cuts to educate to uh, Department of Human Services funding about eighteen million dollars. They cut their the requirement on agencies on on minlars. So it was effectively a three point five percent cut for a, a lot of the agencies. Um, I mean, I'll have to get a sheet that I forgot in my office. I got up at three thirty this morning, Minnesota time, to catch a plane, so. But uh, we'll get, give it to you. Governor, I thought the tax bill, if you didn't make the conformity changes, was going to overproduce revenue, but that didn't appear to be reflected in Commissioner Friend's estimate for next biennium. As you may recall earlier this, in this session, the Department of Revenue put out a, uh, a document indicating what would happen uh, without any uh, conformity. And so that's the end of the forecast. So the $329 million forecast that I talked about that's now and reduce that takes into account whatever changes we see that will happen without any federal conformity. What, what will the tax returns look like? Are they going to be the size of a phone book as the speaker said? Well, with all due respect to the speaker, um, about 13% of Minnesotans file on paper these days, and I assure you it will not be the size of a phone book unless it's one of those. Um, uh, very small phone books. Uh, so I, what will, ha will happen is we will work to update our forms. And when we talk about forms, of course, 20 years ago we talked about paper forms. Now when we talk about forms, we're, we're talking about the uh, electronic and paper structure for how we will file. Uh, so for the vast majority of Minnesotans who use electronic, file, electronic software or use a preparer who uses uh, software, um, there may be some additional questions that they need to answer uh, to make sure that they can account for the differences. Um, one thing that will happen is because uh, Minnesota's law currently includes things like itemized deductions and the federal law no longer allows those itemized deductions, people will need to remember to save their receipts and, and their backup for those sorts of itemizations. But we will work to make this as uh, easy as possible on Minnesota taxpayers, on their preparers, and everyone in uh, the tax ecosystem, like the vendors. And Governor, will, how, will there be 300,000 people paying more? That, that's one of the estimates I've heard. As, the, as uh, Commissioner Fran said, there are revenue adjustments that are in the forecast. But how many people pay more? I would have to get back to you because there was a, there were two sources of revenue that were uh, that will increase. One is individual income; the other is uh, some of the repatriation income. So, I'll have to get back to you with a hard number. No, I mean we're not saying this is by any means ideal, and, and it could and should have been avoided if we had uh, been able again if they had shown any interest to sit down together and and negotiate on the education, uh, emergency school aid, as well as on this, these tax measures. But they wanted a bill that was going to fail. They wanted a bill they could take around the state and raise all these specters of phone book, tax forms, and the like. And you know, furthermore, the legislature can come back next January. These are for uh, income tax uh, file, uh, on, for the calendar 2018 that will be filed in April of next year. So, you know, they can come back and make changes or they can do it uh, after filing for the, um, if they want to straighten this out. I, I'm not, 
saying that's a good a good way of approaching it, but uh, it's not the, the sky is not falling, and the extent is darkened. It's because they wanted it that way. Governor, it's been suggested that uh, you might uh, consider a special session after the election, a lame duck session, to get a jump start on this tax work. Is that something you would consider? I, I mean, I wouldn't. <laughs> Well, I said if it, only if it snowed in July, but it could snow in November. So, that, um, you know, I'm open to suggestions, but I, I don't want to hold out that hope. I, I spent much of the last uh, two years trying to get to a special session, and it's just been impossible. And I think there's no indication that these Republican House uh, leaders are going to want to do anything other than, than what's in their own best interest. It's not in Minnesota's best interest. And, you know, this failure is their responsibility. Failure of this session, failure of these two major bills to be negotiated and agreed upon with with me uh, is their failure. And uh, I know they won't uh, take responsibility for it, but it's theirs. Well, Governor, you are part of this, of course, and people outside this building, all the voters of the state, are going to see that you're leaving the, this session with really nothing done. Um, what, what do you want to tell them about that? Uh, the governor and the legislature didn't get anything done this year. Bonnie goes still out there, I guess. But. You know, as I said before, you know they can ascribe their responsibility. They don't have to vote for me if they. Uh, I mean, I'll take my share of the responsibility. It wasn't for lack of, of trying on our part. We sent 125 letters detailing our opposition to these various policy revisions. I mean, there's no excuse for a, a budget bill, a supplemental budget bill, to be 985 pages of mostly policy, and mostly a policy that they knew I objected to. I mean, this was not about working out a, a, an agreement with me. It was about laying down a, a re-election template and the money to carry it out. This looks like a failure of government, though. It is a failure of government, I'll, you know, a failure of of, of me and the failure of the legislature. And, um, you know, I mean, divided government has not worked well for Minnesota, in my judgment, over the last eight years, but it's worked, it's worked better than it did this time. And, um, you, again, you have to look at what the motives were. It came became clear to me as we approached the end there that, uh, Breaching agreement with me is not was not part of their game plan. Governor, this 989 page bill can be seen as a culmination of a fairly long term trend at the Senator Conference and the Senate Finance and some of the very similar like 2016. Are you concerned that this is becoming endemic to the legislative process at this point? How concerned are you about that? And do you see a way of turning the corner on it? Well, there's been a lot of talk about you know, the, the one subject uh, rule in the Constitution. Somebody's going to have to challenge that and get a get a, a, a favorable ruling from the Supreme Court to really stop it because as long as legislators see one advantage or another to doing it this way, they're going to do it. The things that they want to pass, the things they want signed, you know, they come separately. But, I mean, this one is just absolutely absurd and extremely irresponsible. And, and again, it crowded out things that should have been passed, which should have been able to agree on if that had been their objective. Governor, you spent the better part of three weeks talking about how schools were going to have to make these drastic cuts to get the money. There was some money in this bill, not as much as you wanted. Are now those cuts on your shoulders? Well, 20% of what I asked for was provided. Uh, I'll take, you know, again, They, we could have had the, the entire agreement. We should have had the entire agreement. There's no reason not to have the entire agreement. They wouldn't give up the $200 million for corporations repatriating their foreign profits. That's what it came down to in the tax bill. They wouldn't give up $200 million of tax-free money to large multinational corporations rather than provide what the students of um, Minnesota needed and teachers of Minnesota needed. And, uh, you know, again, they can ascribe whatever blame, but the fact is that that was right there, that opportunity was right there, and, as well as the entire tax bill. And uh, they chose to, to leave it in ashes. 
Commissioner Bowerly, have, have any of the uh, tax prep preparers uh, indicated to you that they may pull out of the state because of these complications or that they may adjust their pricing for consumers? We have not heard that. We will be working closely as we move forward and uh, we have a, a number of tax, prepare, tax software vendors who we certify to provide services in Minnesota each year and we look forward to having those uh, with us again next year. Commissioner, I want to follow up on something else that you talked about earlier with regards to how much more we be paying next year. Earlier this year, I believe it was the Revenue Department that said Minnesotans would be paying as much as $220 million more if there wasn't some sort of tax conformity. Is that number so accurate? Is how much more could we? <laughs> I, I think you'd need to show me that number because that number is not familiar to me. As I mentioned, uh, Earlier, um, there in the forecast that was put out in February, there were forecast adjustments made. So the forecast documents reflect all of those changes, um, and they occur in a number of different types of income categories. So again, we can follow up with you on that um, in terms of what that will look like relative to current law. Yeah, yeah. I just like to say those the, the, that's the result of the federal tax law changes applied to existing Minnesota law. That's not based on the action of myself or the legislature. That's uh, the result of the federal bill and its consequences under existing Minnesota law. Governor, do you plan on your administration going ahead with the nitrate rule, even though it appears the many chairs are going to delay it until about a year from now? Um, I'm going to re review that. That'll be part of what I'll announce later in the week. What is your thoughts, Governor? I'm, I'm sorry. The nitrate, I was saying it's sulfate. Um, I told the Commissioner of Agriculture he should proceed with the rulemaking. We don't believe that that uh, action is even constitutional. It's uh, certainly ill-advised. There's different interpretations of what that, the, that law allows, but the most far-reaching would allow the Speaker and the Majority Leader any time of the year to agree and, and abrogate a rulemaking procedure that an agency is involved in. I mean, that's a vast intrusion into the prerogatives of the executive branch. So we intend to proceed with the uh, rulemaking uh, nitrates. So I've told uh, Commissioner Fredrickson that's what I wanted him to do. And uh, we'll see what happens as a result. Do you plan on taking this to court? I'm not taking it to court. We're just proceeding. Um, that's somebody else's decision. But, you know, the, the major, I mean, he made so many changes that he had 13 different uh, meetings around the state. You know, we modified it considerably. Uh, you know, it, it's just, it's about protecting Minnesota's drinking water. I mean, we're not making this stuff up. We're about, it's about protecting the safety of Minnesotans when they turn on their faucet. And the things that we know we can do, the science says we can do, we clean it up and it has minimal impact on, on farmers who, uh, and there's exceptions to be made if, they, if there are consequences that are adverse to them. It's like, you know, let's, let's get with the modern era of knowledge about what it is that's causing these contaminations of our, of our water supply and do something about it. And that's what this is about. Governor, if you proceed with the rule, it's probably more likely that they would take you to court. Uh, what is your attitude on the, the, the vigorousness of the defense of this if that doesn't be happen? If somebody wants to take me to court, I'd get taken to court on a regular basis. Governor, that's why I have an attorney general. <laughs> you would, you would. And a great, an excellent general counsel. You would vigorously uh, defend your position on, on this, Governor? What's that? You would vigorously defend, defend your position on this? Yeah, we would say that we think it's unconstitutional and it's just a vast overreach of legislative intrusion into prerogatives uh, assigned to the executive branch. Any last questions on tax have, budget before we go to other topics? I have okay. a question. Okay. I'll do two more. Yep. This budget, this uh, omnibus uh, supplemental budget bill has a lot in it. A lot of people like, for example, the um, hotline for uh, suicide prevention hotline money is sort of waiting to find out if they get their money to continue that hotline. I just wonder, I know you're vetoing both bills, or did, 
how do you address that where people are, there's some pretty important uh, money in there for, for programs, I just want to I ask you. I say the, the legislature mismanaged it and caused the, that situation. The, it's their responsibility for it, with any governor to, to come up with a bill like that one that, that the governor uh, will sign. We never had any discussions in the th three brief meetings I had face to face with them in the last week about the budget matter. It was about policy. I mean, they just, and again, they didn't want a satisfactory resolution. They didn't want those things to be funded, I maintain. They wanted the, the impasse. They wanted it to fail. They wanted to go out and blame every, uh, blame on me everything that the people rightfully wanted and should have received. That, that's their failure. That's their responsibility. If they can't manage a legislative session, come to a conclusion with agreements, as we have in all the other seven sessions, we had one that went into uh, a shutdown, but we worked it out uh, because that's that's all our shared responsibility, and they didn't meet that. One more here, and then is it known whether the tax veto will result in a net increase in revenues, and should Democratic candidates be prepared to defend against your veto as sort of a stealth tax hike? I'm not sure. Well, I again, Commissioner Bowerly. Uh, address that. Uh, I, I don't. She can get back to you with the details and go back and review the notes. But the fact is, whatever, if there are any increases on individuals caused by the federal tax law changing, and we were going to try to make changes to offset that, for example, an itemization, which now, we did not change one word. Can you change a word of the tax, of the Minnesota tax code? Not a word. So whatever increases are solely the responsibility of the federal government and their bill. Governor, would you give this session a, a grade or an incomplete? Uh, I, I got, I got, I don't do grades anymore. <laughs> I think my opinion of it has been uh, well stated. Governor, you canceled a, a couple of visits to schools today. Do you plan to go out on the road and defend this action to counter whatever Republicans might be Well, I, I was in Washington yesterday. I sat on the tarmac at uh, National for three hours. Uh, well, this, they shut down the whole airport, and then they took us back to the gate, and the pilot said they couldn't fly because they'd gone over their time limit. And uh, I've never seen such a mob scene at the airport because they sh shut everything down going out for, for over three hours. And, and I concluded that uh, we're probably unlikely to, get, to be able to, that they're going to find two pilots hanging around and, and fly the plane. They did eventually, I guess, leave at 10:45, so that was eight hours late. But I chose to stay overnight and get up early this morning and take a first flight here to be here for this. And we'll have to reschedule the the uh, fly around. It's unfortunate, but beyond our control. Will you be taking any different message to Peter Duluth the door than you told us today? Is there no. anything else you could tell us? No, not essentially. Should I tell our reporters they can stay home? <laughs> well, in your case, I'll be, I have to say that there'll be something really <laughs> revealing that in Fargo Moorhead that uh, you and nobody would want to miss. <laughs> Governor, at first it seemed like you may take, uh, you know, much longer to read these bills. You, you noted that you had 14 days, and it certainly seemed at the time like you would take close to that. Did your timeline for deciding on these bills change, and if so, why? Well, uh, my staff's reviewing the bills now. I've got a tremendous staff who worked literally around the clock the last week and are now plowing through these bills. We want to, after what happened last year, read every word and understand uh, what's in there and what maybe is buried somewhere. So, but I, you know, I, I recognize people want to know and should, should know. So my goal, as I said, is to uh, complete that review and, and make decisions and announce those decisions by, by, the, by the end of Friday. I, I can't, they're, they're extenuating circumstances on, on a couple, that may be the case, but that's my goal. Sorry, to be clear, I mean on the omnibus budget and tax bill. No, I vetoed those this morning. Those yes, bills are vetoed. No, I, it seemed like you may take longer at first to review them, but you decided to veto them. Well, it gave them the it gave them the priority, and I've had people combing through them. And I, I will say there was nothing, no, uh, nothing in there that we found that was uh, like last year. You know, snuck in. To, 
uh, it was 985 pages of stuff put in. They didn't need anything else at the end. Did you not cover any poison bills in that review? Just the whole bill. <laughs> Governor, yeah. do you anticipate on the bonding bill that uh, uh, is this kind of lining up for selective line item veto? I'm not going to get forward? into what I might or might not do. I, I, I haven't sat down with my staff to review the bonding bill. I've read it through it myself, page for it by page, but I haven't uh, reviewed it with them. So probably I aim for Friday to have an announcement on that bill. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. Ready? Well, good afternoon. Uh, as you're all aware, the uh, governor has vetoed two of the significant uh, bills that the legislative bodies worked on and got to the governor's desk in a timely manner. Uh, I've got to tell you that I am angry. I am deeply disappointed. Uh, I talked to or texted back and forth with the governor yesterday about the idea of meeting last night and just having a conversation about the whole process and uh, looking at what in the end is best for Minnesota, not what's best for the legislative branch, House or Senate, not what's best for the governor, but what is best for Minnesota. And unfortunately his flight was delayed and he couldn't leave DC and we were going to have a conversation this afternoon. I was shocked that he vetoed the bills without even the courtesy of that conversation. Uh, in the end, uh, it always is the governor's prerogative, but I would have appreciated that. Uh, I want to say that there were zero poison, bill, poison pills in these bills, which is something we worked very hard to make sure that we accommodated the governor with this year. There were some things that we were different on, but nothing that would rise to that level. Uh, in the end, it feels impulsive. It feels vindictive, and it didn't help anybody in Minnesota. I was hoping he would take that extra time even just to let the emotions of this whole conflict settle down a little bit. There's a lot of punching and counterpunching, and uh, it is the way it happens in divided government. And then you get to the end and the dust settles, and you, you sit back a little bit, and you look at the bills, and you look at who does this help, who does this hurt, not who wins and who loses. And if you look at who it helped, there were so many people in the spending bill that will now be impacted. It, it's over, it's, it's vetoed. There's not a special session. The House is not interested in a special session either, either but they're vetoed. And so the money that we needed for elections and security are, is gone. Uh, the money that we needed for DWRS, disabled workers, the, the people that work for them and needed, were, are going to get a 7% cut when they're already on the low end of what gets paid, what, what somebody should get paid is gone. The elder care abuse uh, that fr frankly lands squarely on the executive branch, squarely. Think about all the boxes and boxes of complaints that they weren't dealing with. And so we acted and we said, we're gonna deal with this elder abuse issue. That's gone. The opioid abuse issue that we all struggled to work on, the Senate passed fees, the, the House passed general fund money. Did it really matter whether where the money came from, but rather that we actually put money towards this? So there's no resources for places like Little Falls that actually had a program that was working to actually drive down the, the number of pills being prescribed and getting people off of opioids. Over 500 people in that community off of opioids and addiction. And that we were giving them resources so that they could multiply that same uh, solution, that same model across Minnesota, gone. Safe and secure schools, we all talked about the importance in that. Big, large funding in two of those bills, gone. I will tell you, I hope he passes the bonding bill because that has another $25 million for safe schools. I hope he at least passes that. But everywhere we turn, somebody is impacted because in the end, uh, uh, we're too stubborn to give in and help Minnesota. And that, that just angers me to no end. So where do we go from here? I, I wanted to say, uh, you know, there was, I listened to part of the governor's uh, press conference 
you know, and that it's all about politics and all about elections. I don't think that's fair. The Senate is not up for election. We're trying to get things done. I believe the governor was trying to get things done, and I believe the House was trying to get things done. This veto on this bill, veto on these two bills was really bad for Minnesota. Go to the tax bill. If you look at the tax bill, he kept talking about multinational companies are getting a break here. Oh, you mean like Cargill and Target and General Mills and Donaldson's and Echolab and all these great Minnesota companies that are great Minnesota citizens that contribute to all, th all kinds of things in Minnesota. These evil companies are getting a break. Well, first of all, that's not true. The federal government in the, 19 in the November change in the federal tax bill decided that they were going to deem foreign income as taxable. That meant income made overseas deemed or as though it was here and going to be taxed. But in return, the federal government gave a large reduction in corporate tax rates. There was a trade-off. So in Minnesota, the governor wanted to take all that deemed money, the money that was made overseas and still overseas, and give no corresponding uh, corporate tax rate in Minnesota. And so, we ended up compromising with the governor and took some of it, about 55 million of that deemed income, income overseas, not in Minnesota. We took some of it. So corporations had a tax increase and individuals, almost all of them, either a tax decrease or level. We lowered the lowest tax bracket, we lowered the, the middle class tax bracket, and so that's where 99.8% did not get a tax increase. But it's, it is not true to say that the business community in Minnesota got a break. They paid more. And so if you look at those two bills, you just go, why? And it, it's, it's uh, some of the things I mentioned. But he also, we also, I know he was asked, well, what are some of the things that you were opposed to? And one of them was Minnesota Care for All. That's not out of that bill. That came out in the repealer bill. That was not in the bill. The 3.5% tax or the cybersecurity fee, uh, that basically said that Minute uh, could uh, charge 3.5% for cybersecurity to each agency when they're, when they're moving towards making those systems more secure. They could come back the next year then and request more because of that cost. So I, we didn't think that that was so great that we should veto the bill. So here's some of the things that are in the bill, and I believe you guys had a handout of all the things that we deleted off of the, off of in the negotiations. But uh, a simple thing, uh, Senator Dan Hall had a simple bill that said a local school district, if they so choose, could post the national motto, in God we trust. I don't think that's worth vetoing a bill. We said that, if you want to, if you're in the left lane, you should be moving over because that should be a faster lane. And so we want that, that lane to move faster. Uh, another representative had a desire to have a civics class as part of the requirement for education training, that people would not forget how government works. Counties, uh, we wanted reimbursed when st what state auditor was suing them because they, if you recall, in the end, the auditor wanted all of that authority and we gave local counties the option to choose somebody else besides a state auditor because it was a lot less expensive. Well, then they started suing these counties, and we thought that they should be reimbursed in those lawsuits. Uh, as mentioned, the money for cybersecurity wasn't exactly the way the governor described it. Uh, he talked about defunding HHS, and I, I want to say that we reallocated HHS funding for DWRS, disabled workers, dis those helping disabled workers the federal government, how they interact with the state government, meant that there was going to be $18 million less money for those workers, which was a 7% cut. And we simply wanted to bring them back to where they were. And so we asked, and, and in the bill, it reallocated resources so that happened. We also had a rating system for schools so that parents could know what schools are doing well and what schools are not. It started as a five-star rating. We modified that. But that was that the modified language was in the bill. So I'm not sure what was so great that the governor would veto it for all of the things that I mentioned that were in the bill that everybody wanted. So I don't know where we go from here. I mean, the, these are vetoed. 
session's over, we're moving towards the, the end of this year with the governor, I don't know where we go. We have another election and that's gonna be, I'm sure governor candidates from both sides of the aisle are gonna be talking about what's important and what's not important and maybe it will determ be determined there. But on, on the Senate's, from the Senate's point of view, I'm committed to working with whoever we have in the House, with the governor, but this has got to stop and I'll end there. Any questions? So, Governor, did he contact you even after he announced this? Have no. You heard? Did you hear from him yesterday? Did, was it a two-way text? Yes. Text that changed? And he gave you no indication that the decision was coming? No. Okay, so many, basically, warnings that if you don't pull the stuff out of these bills and, sign, and offer them separately, that they get cheaper. Why didn't you do it? So if, if you look at a number of the bills that we did do separately that he, it was vetoed whether it was an individual bill, vetoed whether it was a big bill, um, whether it was the, the funding for deputy registers. Uh, he said, well, it's gotta have Midlar's funding. Well, that was in the bigger bill. Uh, there, I mean, the protest bill he had ind indicated at one point that he would sign it. And as you see, we just had our light rail blocked again. We feel that that was important. Again, that was vetoed. And so in the end, uh, part of it was about running out of time. And part of it was uh, that we wanted a bill that had so many good things in it with a few minor uh, policy provisions. When you look at, look at them, that um, we thought that he would sign that. So. Was there ever a pledge to opioid, elder care, Safety no, there was a lot of conversation about whether those should go separate or not. The one that uh, I can say there was a pledge to pass clean was the, the pension bill, and that happened at the very end. It, it did get done. Certainly, both the House and Senate, we, we both individually talked about what's the best way to get these through. Uh, sometimes it's about building consensus. Uh, sometimes it's about getting in, in the Senate about getting 34 votes to move something through. Uh, I can't speak for the House, but uh, you know, I was in some of the same breakfast meetings. Uh, there was absolutely conversation about it, but I wouldn't say it was something like, I give you my word. Those are uh, fewer between. Uh, the governor has given me word, his word on about three occasions and kept it. When I give my word, I keep it as well, but not, I, I would say not in that one. Is it saying something that you guys aren't even on the same page of how things transpired or uh, what the facts are, I mean, isn't that indicative of you could have seen this coming? Yeah, I, it's obviously very disappointing. And that's why I wanted to give you the list of uh, all of the things that we were in disagreement about, about and all the things that we took out, uh, in addition to the repealer bill, which took out more things uh, to try to get the governor to sign it. But I, uh, in the end, I can only control me and hopefully the Senate. Um, I think we all need to figure out how to work better together. Asked long ago because you pointed to the seven bills he vetoed. He also signed 81 bills so far this session. So it's possible that he might have signed some of these things, at least the things that he liked that were in the bill. Why, again, I will ask, why not pull those out on some of them separate bills? Why do we have to have these gigantic 989 page bills? Yeah. Uh, it's a good question. I'm, I'm open to looking at that in the future. How do we do it different? Um, uh, I know that Democrats, when they had the House Senate governor, did, uh, Senator Cohen did a very similar thing, but uh, there is certainly some benefit to doing it both ways. With the veto of the tax bill, how bad is it going to be for uh, Minnesota taxpayers early next year? So the Senate is the only one that's here next year in January for sure. We don't, we don't know whether the House will be Republicans or Democrats. We have no idea who's going to control it. We don't know who the governor is going to be. And so... It's our responsibility to get that bill done as soon as possible for conformity. I don't know that you could find a better bill than the one we just passed uh, because, of, as I mentioned, the, the lowest two tax brackets were lowered. And keep in mind, our lowest tax bracket is higher than 23 states' highest tax bracket. So we're trying to, we, we have a problem with our tax brackets and how we tax people in Minnesota. So. The fact that we're trying to lower those two a little bit, the middle class one and the low income one, uh, would benefit everyone. And so 
you know, I don't know how that it would change at all from next year, but we'll see who the, re who the governor is. Obviously, I hope it's a Republican governor, but uh, we'll see. Do we know what the net effect of the tax veto is going to be? Is it because there's no conformity? Is that going to be a net increase in revenue to the state? And do you have a problem with that if it's true? So first of all, the conformity was first about simplification. Uh, if we do nothing, the tax revenue does not change dramatically. If we had conformed, just simply conformed, Minnesota would have had a large increase in revenue, both for the, from the individual and the, the business community. So we were trying to avoid that. So now what we've got is uh, something where we have to do it right away in January. Otherwise, people are actually going to do two separate tax bill or tax filings, which will be more expensive and very complicated. And so our hope is that we get there right away. Uh, that's another reason it should have been done, uh, but, but it wasn't. How scared are you about the potential that Democrats take the House and rather than being a simple process to achieve tax conformity in January, it becomes another philosophical battle? I don't think it'll be any more difficult next year with a different governor and a different House than it was this year. This felt like the most difficult uh, of the two years. Last year, we did pass a two-year budget uh, with tax relief for many people, seniors, small business owners, students with, or with student loans. Uh, farmers had got a tax break, and we passed transportation and education funding. We did a great two-year bill uh, that I think most people were very proud of. This year was just um, maybe a compilation of a number of years uh, of the governor being frustrated with the legislative branch. Uh, you can go back to when Democrats had the House and Senate with the governor. He had mentioned that Senator Box stabbed him in the back. Go back farther, and there was conflicts with Republicans. And so um, you know, it, it was difficult. And I, I understand that he was frustrated. It, it can be a very frustrating process. Uh, in the end, you don't get everything you want. Uh, the legislative branch certainly doesn't. Uh, the governor certainly doesn't. In the end, this time, nobody got what they wanted, and Minnesota is the one that suffers. When Speaker Dow left the room Saturday, um, Speaker Dow conceded that at this point it doesn't look like the governor will sign them. Do you feel like you did enough in order to satisfy the governor, or did at the end of uh, Sunday night until Monday morning, did you feel like you had taken a gamble? I would have uh, preferred to have, have uh, tried to have, I wish we'd had more time to negotiate with the governor at the end. It felt like if we'd had one more day, that might have helped. Uh, uh, talk through, but in the end, some of the reasons that, that he didn't want to pass the bill were some of the reasons I just uh, handed out to you that we think were, were important just the same. And so, but another day of negotiation I think would have helped, but in the end, we have a constitutional deadline. We had to get the bills to the governor uh, before that time. The governor has said no special session that you had your chance for you to approach him about one anyway if there's a path ahead. So the governor said he doesn't want a special session. I don't think the House wants a special session either. Unfortunately, we have an election year. There's a lot going on uh, with the governor race and the House uh, race. Uh, that's what makes this so difficult, because in the end, we don't, we should be doing these things. And I, but I don't know that we would be any farther down the road uh, a month from now or two months or three months uh, than we were right now. I think it was as close as the, the House and Senate could agree to, uh, to get to the governor, and it was, uh, obviously not far enough. So you see this is final? I do, I do see this as final. Mr. Leader, the governor seemed to at least kind of leave the door open for possibly a lame duck special session after the election to try to streamline the conformity process and make it a little easier going into the new year. What are your thoughts on that? Would you like to do that? So, so I didn't hear them say that in the press conference, but uh, I would be open to that for the tax bill. The tax bill is a big deal for Minnesotans. I hope we get that done. You've been reticent to express anger before, and you're expressing it now. Do you feel that perhaps you were too patient, you were, you were too forbearing, or is your approach going to change going forward? No. Uh, I am who I am. Uh, I think this place works better with uh, honor and respect. Uh, we, have, we have passionate people that disagree on all kinds of issues, but in the end, if you can't uh, have honor and respect, it's really hard to come to the, to the close. Uh, I'm not going to change uh, our, our way of doing it. I think the Senate, uh, I can only speak for the Senate, uh, but I think that's the way government should work. So I think, did you believe that the governor did not, did not operate with honor and respect to cases in the Senate? No, I, I'm not going to comment about that.
Did he have problems negotiating with the House? I'm not going to comment about that. And on a slightly different subject, what do you think about uh, the egg chairs proceeding with their uh, delay of a nitrate rule? Well, the, the legislative branch has its unique powers and the executive branch has its unique powers. And that's the, the, uh, the wonder of our divided government and, and branches of government is that it, no one uh, branch gets to make all the shots. And so you see that, that tug of war going on. We, we in the legislative branch think that we have gone too far with regulations and, well, taxation I already mentioned. And so where we can insert ourselves for Minnesotans, for farmers and uh, miners up north and municipalities with their wastewater, we're going to insert ourselves. And so it is where you have a tug of war, when you have two strongly held views that are quite different from each other. And unfortunately, we saw that collision uh, in the last few weeks. OK, so answer my question. What do you think of the nitrate action? Is that good? Should they proceed on delaying it? Uh, I, I think that the, the uh, Senator Weber and, and his movement forward from the ag community has every right to do it, and I support his decision to do it. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you, guys. I hope not to see you again for a while. No. All right. Well, we'll get started. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for uh, joining me for a few minutes. Uh, Obviously, incredibly disappointed in the governor's veto, uh, not only of the tax bill, but also of the supplemental spending bill. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that are going to be hurt by this, and, and uh, I just can't tell you how incredibly disappointed I am that the governor uh, chose politics over helping these people. So, um, you know, I have a list of people in front of me. Um, that are going to be affected by this, uh, and it just, I mean, it's a staggering, I'm not even going to read it, it's just a staggering list of people. Um, and I think you just heard from some folks uh, that are going to be negatively affected by this. Um, and I think everybody's going to ask why. Um, and, and the reality is uh, he didn't need to veto the bills. Um, I'm just incredibly disappointed. Uh, I'm, I'm actually to the point where I'm embarrassed for the governor that he did this. Um, and I, I don't know how we move forward from here. So I can take some questions. Were you able to com communicate with him? I, I believe that Senator Gazelka said there was really no communication, no forewarning that this was going to happen. Did you, had you heard anything from the governor before these vetoes were? No, nope, I did not. Uh, in fact, you knew about the vetoes before I did. So, which is uh, pretty telling of the last two weeks. Um, every communication that uh, we had with the governor's office, the press knew about before we did. Um, in fact, we invited him to a meeting, uh, I think it was on Monday or Tuesday of last week uh, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. He never even gave us the courtesy of saying no. He literally told the press that he wasn't going to the meeting, didn't even tell us. Um, so the, the governor's actions in the last couple of weeks have, have literally been embarrassing. Um, and, and here we are. Now there's a, a whole pile of Minnesotans uh, who are going to be uh, irreparably damaged by this. Mr. Speaker, um, it, this was kind of a gamble. You put all the stuff in one bill, like 186 pages. Um, well, if these are so important. Why not separate them out? You know, even when we did separate things out, uh, I'll, I'll bring your attention to the deputy registrar money. We sent that by itself. Uh, the governor vetoed that and then put in his veto letter that he vetoed it because it wasn't part of a bigger bill. I, I, I'm just... I don't even have anything to say. I, 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 I can't answer for how illogical this governor has been for the last two weeks, and, and, and beyond that, but two weeks that, I, that I'm paying attention to. You're embarrassed by his actions. You're disappointed. Uh, he's been illogical. What are you saying? Is, are you describing the governor in, in what? You know, it, 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 my, I have worked with this governor uh, for six years as leader of my caucus, four years as the Speaker of the House, um, and... and um, every opportunity this governor will choose politics over people. Um, I think he generally wants to help people, but when given the opportunity, uh, you know, he could have signed this bill. I, you know, I think when you, when you look at his reasons for vetoing it, they're, they're very, very weak. Um, he very obviously chose politics over helping these people. And, and 
I don't know if he really understands the depth at which people will suffer because he vetoed these bills. Forward, short of, see you next year. See you next I don't. The governor can call a special session. Uh, if he wants to do that, we'll certainly come back. Um, but I, I, I will not. Uh, I think these folks need to ask him to do that. I think the people impacted by these bills need to ask the governor to, to do that. Mm -hmm. The governor obviously didn't show up to do his job the last few weeks. Um, and you know now he wants to veto bills and blame other people. Um, I think we elected this governor to be the leader of the state, and I think he has failed our state. Um, and the people who are going to be hurt by this are the ones who need to call him to action now. Go ahead. Um, he left open the door ever so slightly to the possibility of maybe a uh, lame duck session after the elections, uh, something you said you would have to be convinced upon. Again, our Constitution gives our governor the, the ability to call a special session, so I'll leave that ball in his court. Uh, I really wish that he would have taken advantage of the last three months and engaged us in a way that uh, we could have gotten some meaningful things done. Um, even when he was not engaged, we did our job. In fact, in, in a couple of occasions, we did it more than once, um, and that still wasn't enough. So um, I think, uh, you know, he's, by saying he doesn't want to have a special session and that he didn't want to, uh, you know, participate in negotiations at the end of this session, um, he, do he doesn't care an awful lot about the people that will be hurt by these bills, apparently. Mr. Speaker, even conceding the point that the governor didn't need to do this, by, by putting everything in all in one bill, you're sort of giving him an all or nothing sort of choice. Will you make a different, will you take a different approach next time? Will, will you do something different than piling everything into a 989 page bill in the future? Well, next time there will be a different governor, so I have a feeling uh, you'll, you'll find out that the common denominator in all of the difficulties we've had for the last eight years has been our governor. I remember a time in 2013 or 14, um, probably was in 14 actually, at the end of that session, I was the minority leader, and all four leaders sat in a room and signed an agreement, and then Paul Thiessen, who was then speaker, took that agreement for the governor to sign, and the governor refused to sign it. And that was when Democrats controlled the House and the Senate. And, and we all threw our arms up in the air and said, you know what? We're just going to do it anyway. We have agreement amongst the four legislative leaders. We're just going to pass these bills and send them to his desk. I mean, more often than not, this governor, when asked to engage, has been missing in action. Um, and, and even when Democrats were in control of the legislature, he, he refused to come to the table and he refused to sign agreements. Um, he ended up signing all those bills. There was nothing really objectionable in the agreements. He just wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't engage. He wouldn't be part of it. Um, and, and I think the people that lose are the people that were just in this room, you know, the disability community, uh, schools, you name it. I mean, there's a lot of people that are going to uh, be, be uh, hurt by the governor's actions today. Well, is the oh, risk reward worth it? To press on that issue to follow up if I could. Go ahead, Hitler. You bear some responsibility, do you not? The governor says that you folks put all this in there. You took a risk, and in fact, he says that this is exactly what you want. Even, no, no, what we wanted was for the governor to sign the bills. That's why we sent them to him. Uh, even, even when we separated out individual items and sent them to the governor, and the best example of that is the deputy registrar bill. We sent him a clean bill to give $9 million to deputy registrars to help them through an emergency that this governor created he said he supported it. He vetoed the funding, and, and in his letter he said, I'm, I'm vetoing this funding because it's not included in a bigger bill. And in that letter he had the gall to say, even though I'm vetoing it, I do support this funding. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I can't even respond to that. It doesn't make any sense. Respectfully, but directly, uh, you, we've never seen a bill this big. Uh, we've never seen a bill like with so many subjects in one in, in one package. There was a lot this of really there was a lot of really good things to help a lot of Minnesotans in this bill. Not bad things that they thought. Well, could he list them for you? Seemed to me that when I heard about the press conference, the governor had trouble remembering what the bad things were that were in the bill. The reality was the governor was never going to sign these bills. I knew that when he came out with his school funding. Uh, you know, I'll give you a tax bill when, when you give me $130 million for schools. And you know what? 
We called this bluff. We gave schools 225 million and he vetoed it anyway because that's what he wanted to create in an election year was that somehow this session was a failure. This session wasn't a failure. Our governor was a failure. And Minnesotans will be hurt because he chose politics over people. That's the reality of what happened. He's saying you guys did the same thing. You sent him a bill knowing he would veto it to take on the campaign. Six times, time. six times last week that I can remember, we tried to meet with the governor and he wouldn't meet with us. He did meet with us once or twice here or there, came to the table on Tuesday morning and said, I refuse to negotiate with you. Oh, okay, there's almost a week left of session. You're refusing to negotiate with us. What did he expect us to do? We were going to get our work done on time, and we did. And, I'm, and, and we're very proud of the product that we put on his desk. That, that legislation would have helped hundreds, if not thousands, of people, hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans. Um, and now those people will be hurt by his actions. Do you intend to take this approach again in the future? Will we see a larger than the 898-page bill? The, the problem will not exist after the next election because this governor will no longer be in office. Uh, I, I think, you know, I don't want to make the story about me, and I don't want to make the story about the governor. This story is about all of the people that the governor has hurt by vetoing this bill. That's what the story today is about. Outside this building, I think a lot of Minnesotans think it's a failure of everybody, a failure of government. That's what the governor wants people to believe. But, you know, I, I can't answer for why the governor wasn't engaged during session. He'll have to answer those questions. I don't know. I don't know. But his, his, park, his parking spot sits empty there almost every day. He doesn't even come to the Capitol. What do you think? He's not engaged? He hasn't been engaged. He hasn't been engaged at all in his job here. Is he up for the job? I don't know. That's for you to answer. But today he made a, a grave mistake and vetoed bills that would have helped hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans. And now those people will be hurt. He wanted money for education. Um, I think you're going to see uh, on special education because of the uh, uh, forecast adjustment in the finance bill, you're probably going to see a 60 to $90 million cut to schools because of this veto. So the, the ramifications are real and, the, and the, the hurt that people will feel because of this is real. It's not politics. This is real. Can you talk a little bit about the campaign trail, though? How do you explain what happened to voters, voting members? You know, um, and we're not done. Uh, the governor uh, has, a, has a, a bonding bill on his desk as well that we're waiting. Uh, I don't think he's signed that yet, right? I'm going to make a prediction. I'm going to predict he vetoes that, too. For no other reason than politics. Um, but we'll see what happens. My, my folks, uh, when they go on the campaign trail, are going to have a lot of really great things that they can talk about. Um, not only this session, but last session as well. Uh, we put a, a record amount of money into road and bridge infrastructure. We passed a, a record amount of tax relief. Um, we did a lot of great things that, that really will help Minnesotans. Um, so we're going to be really proud of that as we go out on the campaign trail. Um, and I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed that this session uh, had to end this way. But uh, I can't force the governor to be engaged in the process. I can't force him to help Minnesotans. Um, I, we can only do our part. And the Constitution has given us the ability to come into session during a certain window and, and pass bills and put them on the governor's desk. The Constitution doesn't give me the right to sign bills. But what this governor has failed to realize is the Constitution doesn't give him the ability to pass bills. He actually has to work with us. And that's the part in eight years that he has never figured out. He's never figured out how to work with the legislature. And I'm afraid that that will be his uh, failed legacy. Saturday night, you left the room with your, in your final meeting with the governor and said uh, something to the effect of, we don't expect the governor to sign this, these bills. Um, is there anything more that you could have done? Or is it, is, no, is, what you're saying, is what you're saying is there's no bill that the governor would have signed? I I think, we'll see what happens with the bond bill, but I, I actually think at this point there's no bill the governor would have signed. I think he had his mind made up that he was going to veto bills and blame other people for it. And, and that, to me, is politics. Um, you know, regardless of the number of people that were hurt, it uh, didn't really matter. Uh, the, the governor had kind of made up his mind on what he was going to do. So, um, you know, disappointing, of course. Um, on Saturday night, we actually made uh, quite a few more adjustments to the bills um, and removed things that the governor said were objectionable. Um, we did that right up until uh, Sunday night. 
one of the last bills on the House floor was a bill removing more things that the governor said were objectionable from the finance bill. Um, just because we were trying to guess where, where we needed to move to get a signature on the bill. Um, you know, we guessed wrong. Apparently the governor had to have absolutely every single thing that he wanted in the bills. And, I, and I'm afraid that that wasn't even going to be enough. You know, when he said, we'll give you a, a tax bill, a uh, tax conformity bill, which by the way, isn't something that we even necessarily want or need. Minnesotans need that. Uh, so that they can file their taxes next year. Um, he said, you know, you can have a tax bill if schools can have $130 million worth of funding. We called this bluff. We gave schools $225 million worth of funding, and he vetoed the bill anyway. Over what? Nothing. You know, I, it, it's just incredibly disappointing, incredibly disheartening. Is your view that uh, he was never going to sign things in, in retrospect? Because right after Sandy died, you, you predicted that he would sign it. Were you surprised? I actually, I actually thought when he looked at what was in this finance bill, reviewed it, he said he was actually going to take closer to the 14 days to review it. Um, when, when he looked at what was in these bills, uh, that he would sign them, but he didn't look. He had, he had his mind made up, and I, you, know, you can see why he did this, right? He didn't want to lose the news cycle this week. He wanted, after you get past uh, Memorial Day weekend, right, nobody remembers the legislative session or that these bills hadn't been signed, right? Get your veto on them now so you can get maximum political exposure out of it. Um, he's using all of you. I hope that's okay with you, but uh, it's unfortunate because a lot of Minnesotans got run under the bus in the meantime. But You were surprised, really. I, actually, I was, yeah. I expected that he would sign the bills. If you actually look what's in them, um, and, and if you look through his list of objections that was left, and there was a very small list, we removed the most objectionable items. Um, there was nothing in that list that you would say, am I willing to live with a $90 million cut to special education to K-12 schools? Am, am I willing to, to live with that because this was so objectionable? No. You know, there's, he, he, he brought up a couple of things. 3.5% requirement for agencies to use for cybersecurity. He didn't even say it right in his press conference. I don't know if he was confused about what that money was for. He said it was for MinLars. You know, uh, the other one is an $18 million cut to DHS. It's not a cut to DHS. We gave, we appropriated money uh, last session for the, the governor to use for a specific purpose. He then transferred that, didn't use it for that purpose, transferred it to use for IT in the future, not even now, but in the future, to get ready for a, a new computer system. Um, obviously didn't need the money if he could just transfer it to another use. Uh, so we didn't replenish those funds, you know. That's so objectionable that we need to give a $90 million cut to schools. Sorry. Mr. Speaker, one of the themes that the governor made in his, in his press conference was that you folks, and he said the House GOP specifically. Uh, he said I wonder why he didn't single out the Senate. Maybe because they're not up for election? That's what this is about. <laughs> you can only relay what he said. Right, sure. Yeah, he said the House GOP cozied up to special interests. He used several examples. He said opioids, meaning big pharma. He said guns, meaning the NRA. He said Minnesota care buy-in, meaning the HMO industry. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to those allegations that you're bad, for lack of a better term. The Minnesota the care buy-in uh, was removed. That provision that, that would have prohibited that was removed from the finance bill in that cleanup bill that we did almost uh, the very end of session. Um, so if he... I mean, he's just wrong if he thinks that was in the bill. Um, uh, the opioid thing, I literally called a couple, of the op or a couple of the opioid manufacturers into my office and said, you need to come to the table. Um, you need to come to the table, and you need to do it voluntarily. Uh, I was disappointed that they didn't. Uh, one of them came back with an offer that I thought was lackluster, that wasn't going to be helpful. Um, we, just simply didn't have, we just simply didn't have the votes for it. And that's not uncommon in the House, right? In an election year, people see that as a tax increase, and people don't want to raise taxes in, a, in an election year. So we just didn't have the votes for it. But we also didn't see it about punishing opioid companies uh, or manufacturers. We saw it about helping Minnesotans. And, and we found that we could actually help Minnesotans regardless of what you did to opioid companies. I believe that opioid manufacturers will get their day in court, and they will get their punishment if they've been bad actors. But I never believed that that was the legislature's job to do that. Um, there are people in the legislature and outside the legislature that are really passionate about the opioid issue. And um, it became apparent to me through the process that it was almost more important to punish the opioid companies than it was 
to help Minnesotans. Um, and I hope that wasn't the case, but it looked like that was the case. Um, we, we split the bill and, you know, the House bill actually didn't have the penny a pill or, uh, or the fee in it. Um, so from the House's perspective, we weren't on that track anyways. Um, but we did make a commitment at the beginning and all the way through session that we were going to do what we could to help Minnesotans with the opioid crisis. Um, and I believe the legislation we passed was good and would have helped Minnesotans. Um, but it doesn't matter now. It was vetoed. And what about guns in the NRA? You know, uh, we have some of the strictest gun laws in the country already, and we have that because uh, Minnesota revisited their gun laws after the uh, uh, Cold Spring or Cory shooting that we had here in Minnesota some years ago. Um, there were some bills that went through. Uh, I had an opportunity to not hear those if I didn't want to. Um, I said, no, we're going to have a debate about these issues. And, and we had public hearings on them, I think, on a couple of occasions uh, in the House. Unfortunately, those bills that were brought forward didn't have enough votes to move out of committee, uh, so they didn't uh, advance further. But um, I think that people you know, still want to take an, an honest, genuine look at those issues and see if there are things we can do uh, to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous criminals. Um, but you know, the governor trying to say that the NRA somehow has some, I mean, it's just, it kind of shows how disconnected the governor is from, from this building. Governor, forgive me, Speaker Dow. Um, I wasn't at the scrum, so I didn't hear, hear in person, but there were indications that you had suggested that there was some possibility of some kind of gun legislation in the session, but that sort of evaporated. I don't know what happened. What, what, what was, what's the reality there? Yeah, you know, I think there, there was actually one bill uh, introduced that, that would have, I think, increased the use of background checks, but, but made it voluntary um, in those private. I also don't believe that guns are being transferred private party to any great extent. If it does happen, it's between two people that know each other, family members, uh, hunting buddies, that sort of thing. Um, there's not really any evidence that it happens much beyond that. Can it happen? Yes. Uh, but we do have tools in place. Uh, someone can go to their uh, sheriff's department or their police office and uh, police chief and get a, a permit to purchase, uh, which subjects you to the background check. And if you're selling a, a firearm private party, if I was selling a firearm private party to somebody I didn't know, I would require one of those. I would not sell one because I would be liable if that person did anything with that firearm. Um, so, you know, those things already exist in state law. Uh, so, you know, we looked at what can we do to actually help. And, and what we focused our energy on was school safety and mental health. And I think those were two things that everyone could agree uh, would, would reduce the problem or minimize the instance of, of these horrific, uh, heinous crimes. So um, that's where we focused our energy this session, and I'm really proud that we accomplished some great things. Unfortunately, the governor vetoed them, so those people won't get that. Whether you view the governor as being the problem, was it a tactical mistake to put all your eggs in one basket? I don't believe so, because even when we didn't put them in, a, in, in one basket, the governor vetoed the bills and blamed it because they weren't all in one basket. Uh, I mean, you just, you know, I could probably make a lot of money predicting if I could predict accurately what this governor was going to do, but I can't, and neither can anyone else. He signed 81 bills, didn't he? So there's a chance he would have signed a few of them. Well, he, he also vetoed a lot of bills. I didn't keep track of the exact numbers, but in-, in I think it's 10 now at yeah, this point. In, in just at the end of session here, he vetoed quite a few bills, and I, Probably, probably some more coming. I just signed quite a few bills the other day. Uh, yesterday, I think. Was it yesterday? Um, I think yesterday. So. In the governor's press conference, he repeatedly said, House Republicans. Uh, I, I wonder if it's because we're up for election, do you think? Do you think he might be playing politics? I understand that. Uh, but is there a... And was there, and I understand it's going to be moved fairly soon, but was there a fundamental personality conflict between you and the governor? I mean, I understand that, you, you know, you said you've said on repeated occasions you yeah. got along, but it sure seems like you yeah. folks didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things in a real fundamental way. Well, you know, from my perspective, no. Obviously, from the governor's, he can't seem to get past that. I, I don't know why. Uh, I don't think I've ever done anything, uh, you know, and it, and it really doesn't matter, right? Our personalities don't matter. The job that we have to do and the job that both of us were elected to do is, is bigger and more important than whether we get along with each other on a personal level. Um, you know, the governor and I do get along fine. I had an aunt and uncle here uh, 
probably three weeks ago, and just happened to, I was giving him a little tour of the Capitol and just happened to pop into the governor's office. And he happened to just be finishing up a press conference, so he was in the building. Um, and I just asked at the front desk, is the governor here? Could he greet my relative? We spent 20 or 25 minutes in his office, uh, and he was just very gracious. And, and that's how our personal relationship is. We get along fine. Um, but he obviously, you know, has some problem with, you know, I, the voters elected a Republican majority in the House and a Republican majority in the Senate. And, and the governor obviously has some problem with that and wants to change that. So he's, he's throwing, you know, uh, health care workers under the bus and he's throwing school kids under the bus in an effort to try to change that. Um, shameful. Absolutely shameful. So, anything else? Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Wish we were here on better circumstances.